Big Bend had to be a large area to protect its vast array of animals and plants. Much later than most of the other areas of Texas, it was indeed the last frontier here in Texas. Where the rainbows wait for rain and the big river is kept in a stone box and water runs uphill and mountains float in the air except at night when they go away to play with other mountains. More than a century ago, a Mexican cowboy described a mythic land of timeless earth and sky. Rubble-strewn arroyos and mountains shimmer in the stillness of the desert heat. Above is a pitiless sun and the horizon-to-horizon -horizon emptiness of burning sky. Big Bend is remote, on the road to nowhere, almost part of another country. It is a pocket of Mexican wilderness, the vast Chihuahuan Desert, that has strayed into the United States. It is a miracle of abundance of living things, most of them strange, all of them fascinating. It is a land rich with history and legend. Spanish explorers saw it as an obstacle on their road to riches and named it El Desplablado, the uninhabited place. For centuries it was a land that white men hardly dared to enter, swept by war parties of Mescalero Apaches, and at the full of each September moon, the fierce painted Comanche warriors who swooped southward and crossed the Rio Grande to raid lonely Mexican outposts. Time seems to have marched more slowly at the border of Big Bend. Today, the last Texas frontier is a place where the excitement of the Old West may still be sensed in the primitive landscape, the haunting solitude, and the murmuring current of the Rio Grande. A river is a magic, moving, living part of the very earth itself. It is from the soil, its depth, and its surface that a river has its beginning. For nearly 1,000 miles, the Rio Grande pursues its course from the Colorado Rockies to the Gulf of Mexico. Interrupting its southeasterly curve, it turns north for 177 miles 
before resuming its downward arc. Cradled within the tip of its curve is the region and the national park to which the course of the river has given its name. The river marks not only the 107-mile boundary of Big Bend National Park, but also the division of the United States and Mexico. West of the park, the Rio Grande joins the Rio Conchos, born in the Sierra Madre of Mexico. Traversing hot wastelands, slipping along muddy banks and sandbars, the living river is the artery of the desert. Along its banks grow thickets of reeds, willows, and grasses that serve as hunting ground and home for its small creatures. Even the mud at the river's edge provides shelter. Cliff swallows plaster it under overhanging rock, creating a condominium of nests. There has been a procession of life forms across the pages of Big Ben's history, where the shallow thread of river winds once lay broad seaways. A legacy of life turned to stone has been left by the shifting seas. The fossils of shells, sponges, fish bones, imprisoned in the limestone cliffs. Later, this was the swamp environment of dinosaurs, the terrible lizards that lived, fought, and died on the ground, and flying reptiles. Remains have been found of the pterosaur, a featherless winged reptile whose 36-foot wingspan exceeded that of a small jet fighter. Hippo-like plant eaters and an ungulate related to both clawed and hoofed animals are among the recorded species of the age of mammals that began about 64 million years ago. Dinosaurs had been extinct for 15 million years, but turtles remained and are here today. Here, too, have been found the bones of Eohippus, the little ancestral horse, presager of grassy plains and grazing animals. Evolutionary selection has produced the plants and animals adapted to the changing environment of Big Ben. Across the eons, an ancient lily evolved into grass. Through countless ages, it awaited the latest arrival, man. Today, visitors gaze upon a land that seems as permanent as eternity. Amid the stillness, the Rio Grande moves ceaselessly on its course. The basic landscape configurations of Big Bend were set in motion 75 to 100 million years ago, as the land emerged from the sea, faulted, folded, and eroded. Yet, it was the ancestral river that formed the monumental character of the canyons. The structural bedrock patterns were formed of hard marine limestone. Faulting uplifted the bedrock to create the mountain mass. Streams eroded the mountains, depositing a deepening layer of valley sediments. A drainage pattern developed amid the debris and the river's course was set. When it encountered the limestone, the river was trapped. It had no alternative but to cut a canyon. As the process of erosion continues, only isolated mesas remain of the bedrock mountain uplift. Eventually, in a far distant future, the entire bedrock mountain uplift will be eroded away. Only a deep layer of sediments will remain. Eating through the earth like a rivulet of acid spilled from an etcher's bottle, the river carved three great canyons, Boquillas, Mariscal, and Santa Elena. Within the prison walls of the lower seven-mile extent of Santa Elena, the river seems to fade into insignificance. The gorge seems narrow enough to throw a stone across. In most places, 
It is 500 or more feet wide at the top. In the lower canyon, there are places as narrow as 30 feet across. Sheer cliffs drop 12 to 1,500 feet, deep enough for three Washington monuments to stand one upon the other. Frequently, the river is so laden with sediment that rocks five inches below the surface cannot be seen. Bombarded by billions of grains of sand and silt, the canyon is ground deeper and wider by the abrasive action of the water. Time is held captive in these rock walls, immeasurably distant in human time. In splendid isolation, the river runs on. After making the earth, says Apache legend, the creator dumped the leftover rocks on Big Bend. Scattered wide, thrusting up from desert plain, heaped into mountains, they lie here to this day. The mysteries of this fascinating land are the source of folklore. They have inspired quests for lost mines, treasures of gold and silver. Within its rock-walled bastions, Bandits and smugglers took refuge from Texas Rangers and vigilantes. For almost a century, the Chisos Mountains have stood in legend as the hunting ground of ghosts and spirits. The aura of the earth where time hangs suspended is spellbinding. An 1896 visitor wrote, Nowhere have I found such a wildly weird country. The very silence is oppressive. A man grows watchful for his own safety and becomes awestruck by nature. Today, the visitor's imagination may still be captivated by the mystique of Big Bend. Tales of human drama such as the Lost Mine legend date back to the days of Spanish exploration. During the, the era when the Spanish were in this part of the world, uh, in the early 1500s, of course, one of the reasons that they were here was to look for gold and silver. They had been very successful at that in Mexico, and uh, they hoped that they would also be successful at that in the Big Bend region. The truth of the matter is when, when they came here, they were not very successful at finding gold or silver in the Chisos Mountains, but of course there are a lot of legends that relate to the Spanish time uh, of when they were here, and one of those is the Lost Mine legend. And that legend says that when the Spanish were in the area, they established a silver mine up in the Chisos. And they used to use the Native Americans whom they had enslaved to work in that mine. Now the Spanish Presidio or fort that was the nearest to here was in San Vicente, Mexico, which is uh, across the river from Big Bend National Park. And you can still see the foundation of that, of that Presidio today if you go out there. And the legend states that the Spanish used to march the Indians blindfolded from the Presidio there in San Vicente up into the Chisos Mountains to work in the mine because they didn't want them to know the location of it so they couldn't pass that secret on to anyone else. And one day, according to the story, the Indians revolted against their Spanish captors, killed them all, and sealed the entrance to the mine so that no one's ever been able to find it since. Hence the name Lost Mine, and we have Lost Mine Peak in the Chisos Mountains. Uh, the legend goes on to say, though, if you, if you want to find the mine, all you have to do is go down to San Vicente and stand at where the doorway to the Presidio was on Easter morning. And if you're standing there early enough and you're there to see the sunrise, the place where the sun's first rays strike the Chisos Mountains is supposed to be the entrance of the Lost Mine. No one has found the lost mine, if indeed there ever was one. The unexplored places, hidden and guarded by forbidding craggy peaks, are the lure of the mountains. Even the origin of the name remains a mystery. The name of the Chisos Mountains is something that 
I don't think anybody really knows the origin of. Uh, you hear a variety of different stories. I've heard people say that it means ghosts, but yet if you look up the word chisos in a Spanish dictionary, it doesn't mean ghosts at all. Um, one of the more plausible ones is the theory that perhaps the word comes from the Spanish word hechizo, meaning enchantment or uh, something that's bewitching. Uh, and you also hear the word hechicero, which means enchanter. The Chisos Basin has long been the most hospitable region of Big Bend, having harbored Indians, bandits, sheep herders and their flocks, and travelers. In the 1930s, Civilian Conservation Corps workers constructed roads and hiking trails. Park headquarters were located here until removed to Panther Junction in 1952. Today the basin remains a center of park activity with an amphitheater, motel, dining and camping facilities for travelers. The mountains were formed by a series of volcanic eruptions starting perhaps 60 million years ago. Stream erosion hollowed out the basin to its 1,500 to 2,000 foot depth. Volcanic formations are revealed as erosion strips away the softer overlying material. The window was formed by water erosion. All drainage from the basin pours out to the west through the window. The peaks around the basin are the tallest in the Chisos, with elevations up to 7,800 feet. The mountains are a biological island formed by an increasingly arid climate. The Chisos are oftentimes referred to as a temperate island in a desert sea. They're distinctive for many reasons, but among them are the plants. We find, for example, northern plants, aspen, a quaking aspen, Douglas fir, that are found in northern states living here in the Chisos. At the same time, we find things like weeping juniper from Mexico living side by side with these plants from the north. Only 2% of the park's total 1,251 square miles is woodland. Tree species common to other places in the United States are rare here. Since the Chisos is the southernmost mountain range in the United States, most species are more characteristic of Mexico. A startling combination of plant life may be seen here. This is the meeting and mingling of desert and mountain environments. A few species of wildlife are found nowhere else in the United States. Deer were probably more widespread here when the climate was cooler and wetter as a result of glaciers. Once they covered the desert area but have retreated up into the cool recesses of the Chisos. Isolation allowed this subspecies of white-tailed deer to develop. They live only here and in the Sierra del Carmen across the river. Birder 
Traders from around the world will come to the Chisos to look for the Kalima warbler between April and October because that's the only place you're going to find a Kalima warbler in the United States during the breeding period. I suppose that the Chisos could also be uh, classified as distinctive because they're the southernmost range of mountains in the United States and they are the only mountain mass that is entirely contained in a national park. Hiking trails penetrate the 40 square mile wilderness of forested canyons and rocky ridges. The winding Emery Peak Trail follows a ridge to the summit and an overlook into Boot Canyon. The Cowboy Boot is a slender rock column sculpted by weathering and erosion. The wind haunts these high places like a chorus in an atmospheric cathedral. Life seems to end on the escarpment of the South Rim. Topped by a 50-foot thick lava flow, the rim is almost a mile higher than the distant Rio Grande. 2,500 feet below, ageless desolation rolls away across the caldera of an ancient volcano into an indistinct horizon that on a clear day is more than 80 miles away. Beyond an occasional glimpse of Silver River threaded amid brown hills is Mexico, the mystery of another culture, a different time and place. Molten rock that shouldered its way from deep within the earth formed ridges, dikes, and folds. Elephant tusk, an igneous intrusion, emerges from the desert floor, a remnant of primeval turmoil. There is no apparent habitation in the vastness of this wilderness. Here is solitude and a silence that rings loudly in the ears. This fractured land, this violent land, burned by the volcanic turbulence within the earth and by the heat of a blazing sun, its contours speak of a chaotic process of taking form and shape. The relentless forces of erosion have further shaped this ancient land. Its buttresses and mesas and the massive eroded pillars thrusting skyward from wind-scoured plain are weathered monuments to earlier times. Spires were created as molten rock became plugs in softer rock, which has eroded away. These two volcanic peaks were named Mulier's Peaks. In the 1930s, while they were in training in Big Bend, Army Air Corps pilots sometimes maneuvered their planes between the two ears. Big Bend terrain has also been used by astronauts to simulate moonscape. Battered by wind-whipped sand, the earth is marked with a perpetual struggle against rain, sun, and the wind. The desert is barren wasteland to those with unseeing eyes who travel it as a bridge to river or mountains. To those who will linger and discover, it is a sea of fascinating life.
Scorching sun and sparse rain leave only a fragile web for the survival of its inhabitants. The desert vegetation has evolved remarkable ways of not only resisting heat and drought, but of marking off and defending its living space. Each plant in this land is a porcupine, said an early traveler. It is nature, armed to the teeth. Cacti are so heavily armed with spines that they have names like horse crippler, fish hook, eagle's claw, and prickly pear. The stems that support the needle-covered exterior store water and provide the food-making function. There are more than 65 species of cactus found here, more than any other national park. A show of flowers appears during early to mid-April, the peak of the blooming season. Several species of yucca flourish in the park. One of the most impressive is the giant dagger. It is most abundant at Dagger Flat. Cacti and other plants were a source of food and moisture for Native Americans but they use nearly every part of the yucca in countless ways. The tough fibers provided material for sandals, baskets, brushes, and other household goods. They made soap from the roots and ate the flowers and fruit. Reaching tree-like proportions in its 50 to 75 year lifespan, the giant dagger may grow more than 20 feet tall. Flowering plumes soar skyward after wet winters and springs, usually ever two to three years. A single broomstalk may have more than 1,000 flowers and weigh as much as 70 pounds. Although the fierce needle-sharp blades of the lechuguia menace hikers and animals, the parasitic paintbrush grows snugly on its roots. Ocotillo is sometimes called coach whip because it looks like buggy whips growing out of the ground. Each slender wand is tipped with a red flower cluster during early spring. It resembles a green-leaved fountain. Then as the air dries, the leaves are shed to conserve water. Some of the largest ocotillos may be seen along the road east of the park's west entrance near Maverick. During the July to October rainy season, the stem of the candelia plant fills with a milky sap. The sap evaporates and forms a waxy coating on the surface to protect the plant from desiccation. This wax is used in manufacturing candles, commercial polishes, phonograph records, cosmetics, and chewing gum. In Big Bend, before the advent of the park, the wax was processed at Glen Springs, a small settlement that one night was raided by Mexican bandits, a fateful night that drew national attention and the mobilization of the Texas National Guard. A primitive dirt road leads to the spring. Little else remains. Big Bend National Park is the only large acreage of Chihuahuan Desert where the natural effects of geography and climate alone are allowed to shape the land, its plants, and its animals. Big Bend National Park preserves and protects America's best example of Chihuahuan Desert. A wilderness like this offers a place for people to enjoy and study. An unchanged desert land within a country that is fast becoming overdeveloped and artificial. Of necessity, Big Bend had to be a large area, 
to protect its vast array of animals and plants complete within their total environment so that each could continue to survive as they did long before the coming of the first European settlers. The diversity of life in Big Bend is tremendous. Recently, the park published its first checklist of insects and identified over 3,800 species. Biologists also have identified over 1,000 different species of plants, over 432 species of birds, 76 species of mammals, and over 65 species of reptiles and amphibians. It is such biotic richness that led to the park's designation by UNESCO in 1976 as a man in the biosphere reserve, one of approximately 250 such areas worldwide whose ecosystems are particularly well preserved. Biosphere preserves are creatures of the United Nations. The United Nations is trying to identify and recognize those places throughout the world that can serve as models of man living in harmony with the land. Now Big Bend is a biosphere preserve because it preserves the best of the Chihuahuan Desert. It's a laboratory where researchers and scientists can come to study, for example, the plant life. We have over a thousand species of plants here in the park. Who knows what discoveries will be made to benefit man in the fields of agriculture or in the fields of medicine by studying these plants. We already know the creosote, a common plant here in the desert, has a chemical that is used in cancer research. We also know that Wyoli produces latex and that Candelia produces a commercial wax. What other products will we come up with after studying the plants in a biologic preserve like Big Bend? The desert has a beauty that is breathtaking in its shifting shades of light and the range of its colors. Yet this beauty is so subtle that it seems transient, as if the next rainstorm will wash it all away. For most of the year, the earth bakes beneath an intense sun, forming a dry and brittle crust that cracks like the glaze on ancient pottery. But there is a pungent odor of moisture carried in the heavy air. Brewing over the mountain are the clouds of an interlude in the heat and drought, a summer thunderstorm. The short, violent rain and flash flood that have rolled across the pavement of the desert are gone. The smell of dampened dust and fresh-washed vegetation, the profusion of life in a new cycle of regeneration, a plain awash with flowers. This is the fifth season of Big Bend. Although far from civilization and inhospitable to settlement, 
Big Bend has a rich human past. Indians, trailblazers, traders, and emigrants, bandits, ranchers, and miners left their imprint upon Big Bend. Throughout the park, the land holds the memories of their presence and their passing. For thousands of years, people camped in the rich river bottomland where Rio Grande village lies today. Depressions in the rock were used as mortars to grind seeds and grain. Over the centuries, they were worn into deep holes. Rock art, called pictographs, were painted with red cinnabar on the cliff walls. The arid climate protects these prehistoric markings. Until about 1875, Big Bend belonged primarily to the Native Americans. Inevitably, they were hunted and tracked into their last remote retreats, dispersed or banished to the reservation. In the earliest days of Anglo-American exploration, Big Bend was crossed only with great privation and loss of life. When the Chihuahua Trail, a wagon road linking San Antonio, Texas and Chihuahua, Mexico was established, many traders saw Big Bend for the first time. This area was, little, was settled uh, much later than most of the other areas of Texas. It was indeed the last frontier here in Texas. That was simply because uh, people didn't know the secrets of where the springs were, how to extract water and food from the native plants, and cactuses and uh, because of that they had to plan their excursions through the Big Bend by carrying ample water supplies and food supplies to get them across. People were pretty reluctant I think to come down here. They considered this area to be a little bit uncivilized and when the railroad came here in 1882 uh, that sort of changed. The area was now accessible and that coupled with the idea that the land was pretty cheap at the time, and the cavalry's being here had pretty much put an end to most of the major Indian raids. It started to attract people down to this area, and uh, little towns like Alpine and Marathon started to spring up along the railroad tracks, and people started to move down here for the first time to inhabit the area pretty much full time. And with that, of course, came the ranching era. Ranchers began to migrate into Big Bend around 1880, and by 1900, sheep, goat, and cattle ranches occupied a majority of the landscape. Clusters of families lived and farmed where the land was able to support them. As a settler moving down here, the first thing you would have had to be aware of is the isolation here. Uh, people think it's isolated today, but of course we have lots of neighbors and all kind of live in the same place in the park. But back then people were spread out a lot more and the primary contact I think that they would have had would have been with their own families. Uh, they might have gotten together once a month for dances or whatever, but of course even those occasions uh, necessitated a lot of travel on rough roads, very slow travel. Uh, people might have gone to town once or twice a year for supplies uh, or for meetings and so I think they would have had to have been very resourceful as far as uh, enjoying their own company and enjoying the, the company of, of their families. At Hot Springs, an old trading post and a post office are so far removed from human life that one wonders at their existence. Yet from as much as 125 miles away in all directions people came to satisfy their simple needs. The place was named after the two hot springs located near the junction of Tornillo Creek and the Rio Grande. A stone masonry bathhouse, of which only the foundations remain, was erected over the largest spring. Its waters, flowing at a temperature of 105 degrees Fahrenheit, were touted as a cure-all for a host of ailments from hiccups and tobacco poisoning to ulcers. Uh, the Big Bend continues to be uh, extremely isolated to this day. Uh, however, even at that time, uh, it was easily a 10-day trip by wagon to get to Alpine alone. 
And so some, that would be something on the order of uh, living here now and having to go shopping for supplies in California by our modern standards. At the turn of the century, around 1900, the economy of the area changed pretty rapidly with the discovery of mercury or quicksilver in the cinnabar ore throughout the region. And lots of mines sprung up in the area, some of them pretty large, others small. Uh, the largest of them was the Chisos Mining Company, which is the site of the present-day ghost town out in Terlingua. And that, at one time, uh, produced somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the mercury for the United States. And uh, the Chisos Mining Company's heyday was from about 1900 to 1930 or so. There was also a mine within the boundaries of what we call Big Bend National Park today. And that, of course, was the Mariscal Mine. And if you look on your park map, you'll see that still there. Uh, a lot of the buildings are still up. And you can sort of get a sense of the, of the history of this place, I think, if you visit uh, a place like the Mariscal Mine. That mine was operational uh, under a variety of different owners from the turn of the century up until the 1940s and uh, it was a, an important area as far as the economy of this region. But the rigors of making a living from an arid, unforgiving land were not the only challenges to be met. It was definitely a hard life and a, a major problem for all the settlers who lived here uh, in this region and in northern Mexico. Uh, in, with a settlement that was so isolated, you'll find that indeed it was up to you to defend that settlement against any kind of a challenge, uh, including Indians or bandits or smugglers. The few settlers who lived here had a, definitely a difficult time. Uh, even if the different governments, whether it was the Spanish, Mexican, or later on the Texan or American government, could provide any soldiers to help protect the settlers, it was relatively few and uh, definitely a large war party uh, well trained in you know war tactics from birth uh, was a major problem for any detachment of army soldiers regardless of their size. During the era of banditry which pretty much started here of course during the Mexican Revolution uh, in about 1916 was our first big bandit raid, the, the Glen Springs raid and during that era uh, you you will read about the, the family's fears about being attacked by bandits. Some people like the Langfords who owned the hot springs actually left the Big Bend during that era of banditry in order to get away from the border problems that were occurring here. Uh, the, the banditry in this area pretty much slowed down though by about 1920. When 1920 came and the Mexican Revolution was winding down, uh, most of the cavalrymen were pulled out of the Big Bend area because the new president of Mexico wanted to have better relations between the two countries. And so uh, things were quieting down here. They actually abandoned the army, abandoned the castle and army post before it was ever completely finished. And at that time, the Texas Rangers moved in to the old army post to try to uh, keep law and order here along the border. And um, a lot of the stories or the, the old tales that the Texas Rangers had to tell uh, or that are told about their era here are kind of fascinating and one that always sort of makes me laugh is a story that used to be told by Pete Crawford who was a Texas Ranger here in the 30s and he used to tell about the time when he had captured a thief who had supposedly stolen a horse and a saddle from Sam Nail who was the owner of the old ranch that you can still visit uh, today in Big Bend and when Pete finally caught this fellow, he didn't have immediate transportation to get him to the nearest jail, which was up in Alpine. So while he was waiting for transportation, he took him down to the ranger station down there at Castellon, and he handcuffed him to the station flagpole to kind of keep him quiet. And of course, he was out in the hot sun. Pete went inside to do a little bit of work, and a couple of hours later, when his t transportation arrived, he looked out the window to find that the the fellow had managed to pull the flagpole up right out of the ground, slip the handcuffs off the bottom side of the flagpole, and escape back across the river into Mexico. And uh, I guess, unfortunately for Pete, the, the story didn't really end there. And he used to go on to tell that the next day he got a note from across the river asking him to please send the keys to the handcuffs across the river because this guy was having a little bit of trouble going about his business. So. Uh, it's just one of those things, I guess, that shows us that no matter how romantic the uh, lives or the tales of the Texas Rangers are, uh, 
uh, they, they had a lot of problems just like we do today. I guess their frustrations were, were evident as well. With overgrazing of grasslands and farming, coupled with periodic droughts, came a depletion of the land's resources. In the 1930s, many people who loved the Big Bend country saw that it was a land of unique contrast and beauty that was worth preserving for future generations. In 1933, a state park was established, and on June 12, 1944, Big Bend was established as our 27th National Park with the twofold purpose of preserving and protecting historic and natural values while enriching the lives of visitors. We take pictures of the land and the weather. We'll stand at the same spot every day, taking a picture of the same vista, and we record that and compare notes on that. We take weather every day throughout various parts of the park. Well, we've been doing these various studies for over 12 years now in Big Bend, and the results are just starting to come in. And by analyzing the filters and what's in the air, and by backtracking the previous weather patterns, we've been able to find out where some of this bad air is coming from. Well, Take a guess. Monterey. Monterey, Mexico is the number one polluter of Big Bend's air. Mm -hmm. Number two. Either L.A. or Mexico City. El Paso. Uh -huh. No. Houston. There you go. Houston? Houston, Galveston, the petrochemical industry along the Texas coast. Number three. Some of you mentioned it. Mexico, Mexico City. And that's over a thousand miles away. The Big Bend Natural History Association was established to facilitate the interpretive program of the National Park Service. The Natural History Association has been championing the mission of the National Park Service since 1956. Our main goal is to support the interpretive program here. And the way we achieve that goal is by producing publications in cooperation with the National Park Service. Some of these publications are offered for sale, but the vast majority are free publications, like the park's newspaper, the Big Bend Paisano, and many park brochures, such as our site bulletin series on the geology and the wildlife and the history, and many of the trail guides that you see at the trailheads, such as the Lost Mine Trail and the Rio Grande Village Nature Trail. We've also expanded our programs during the past few years to add programs like the Big Bend Seminar Program. This opportunity that visitors now have when they come to Big Bend gives visitors a chance to learn more about the park by going with an expert out into the park for two days or even five days. Some of the seminar topics that have been offered to park visitors include seminars on nature photography, a wildlife identification, wildflower identification, uh, park ecology, uh, history, archaeology, and even floating the Rio Grande. Today, Big Bend is available to everyone. More than 100 miles of paved roads link major sites, once seen only by a few, and the visitor travels a highway with the anticipation of tree-shaded picnic areas and campgrounds. Relaxation is an important element of life during a stay in Big Bend. The desert and the mountains are a revelation to those who will immerse themselves in nature. If you were a Native American 2,000 years ago here, how would you prepare this mesquite bean in order to eat it? 
Yeah, you, know, you can chew them when they're semi ripe. Right. In the holes in the rocks. Exactly. Yeah, you'd lay a whole batch of mesquite beans down on the rocks. Then you'd get another type of a rock to fit your hand real well, and you just start grinding away. The women did that. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> We've been liberated. <laughs> How do we go to women? How do we? There's a Maytag over there. And just picture now, generation after generation of the Native Americans. <laughs> Whoever they were, <laughs> um, grinding mesquite beans on this rock. What would happen eventually? You might just wear a hole in the rock. Beyond the international border, the change in the character of life is felt immediately. Only a few classic border towns remain. Boquillas is one of them. It is a reminder of the big bend that was. Remote from mainstream tourist travel and largely uninfluenced by the culture of its American neighbor, the little community lives at a pace commensurate with its surroundings. Time seems of little importance here. The life of man leads inevitably to a river. The unseen and little used wild parts of Big Bend are explored only by rafting and canoeing through the three great canyons of the Rio Grande. The timelessness of the earth is seen in the rock walls so close at hand. Each layer, each color represents an eternity on our calendar. To run the desert river is to penetrate a long, tortuous corridor. The rock slide in Santa Elena Canyon was created by walls that have peeled off and fallen into the gorge, creating a dangerous labyrinth. To experience the wild and powerful river is to understand why, except for its historic fords, it is all but impassable. Since the establishment of the park, the grasslands are gradually being restored, providing food and new habitats for wildlife. Paisano, fellow countrymen, the Mexicans call the roadrunner. This agile two-foot-long bird can fly, but prefers to run at speeds up to 20 miles per hour. It kills lizards and small snakes, including rattlesnakes, by stunning blows with its sharp beak. The turkey vulture is the harvester of death in the desert, usually seen soaring on the thermal updrafts or dropping to earth in ever-narrowing circles when awaiting its meal. It is the embodiment of desolation. Collared peccaries or javelinas usually inhabit brushy areas and travel in herds of 10 to 20. Even when unseen, their presence may be identified by a musky, skunk-like odor. They are peculiarly adapted to the desert in that they are tough enough to eat cactus, spines and all.
They are shy animals. An approach to humans is only an attempt to identify. They are very nearsighted and must rely upon their senses of smell and hearing. The mountain lion symbolizes the wild character of the country. Once common, the big cat nearly became extinct in West Texas as a result of ranchers protecting their stock from predation. It is estimated that two dozen inhabit the park. Although they are rarely seen, the knowledge of their presence creates a feeling of wilderness. It is an international struggle to protect threatened wildlife and the habitats they need to survive. Extinction can come quickly, and extinction is forever. Some of the nation's rarest life forms and most dramatic landforms are within Big Bend National Park. Across the river is equally spectacular scenery. It is hoped that the Mexican government will create a national park adjacent to Big Bend, thereby joining the international effort to preserve the biological resources of our world so that they may bring the highest and most enduring returns for future generations. In Big Bend, the imagination is stirred to review the rich history of the past as it unfolds along the river's path. Here, the traces of what has gone before may yet be found, preserved in the land of sun, rock, and river, the place where rainbows wait for rain. My dream is that someday Big Bend can be restored to the conditions that were here before the coming of the first European settler. These century plants when they bloom, I don't know if you've ever seen one, but they produce these huge pods of flowers. And it's like a smorgasbord for wildlife, filled with insects getting the food. Other Mexican long-nosed bat. The Mexican long-nosed bat's snout and tongue is physically just the right shape to get down into the tubular flowers on the agaves to get the nectar. And when it does, it pollinates the plant. But it's an endangered species. Agaves are disappearing. They're being over-harvested. Why? Because the world's population likes tequilas. Basically, if we don't take care of our lands, uh, we're going to suffer for it because we're all interconnected with the environment just like the animals are. 